budget users always get the shaft. That's true for a lot of things, but especially true in the world of GPUs. And it's been true for a long time. Decades, in fact. For example, in 2002, your option for a budget GeForce card was the GeForce 4 MX series, which didn't even support the latest DirectX 8 standard for the time. NVIDIA rectified that the following generation with the GeForce FX 5200, a card which supported DirectX 9, same as its big brothers, but performance was so terrible there was scarcely an instance you could make use of DirectX 9 features with any sort of playable frame rate. But then along came the GeForce 6 series, sporting a new architecture with a roided out shader engine. It was a complete turnaround for NVIDIA, and the benefits would ripple all throughout the product stack, including their new budget champ, the GeForce 6200, a card that would fundamentally reshape what users could expect from a low-end GPU. This is Pixel Pipes. Well, hopefully that introduction was dramatic enough. Anyway, yes, today we're going to talk about the G4 6200. And in fact, every major 6200 variant I could get my hands on, which was a lot, actually. Uh, the bulk of which are comprised of TurboCache variants. Let's just quickly go over all the cards I have in my stash, and then we'll dive into some of the differences. Starting things off, we have the original G4 6200 on PCI Express, the 6200 on Oh my God. <clears throat> the 6200 on the AGP bus, the G4 6200 Turbo Cash 16 meg, the 6200 Turbo Cache 32 meg, the 6200 Turbo Cache 64 meg, the 6200 Turbo Cache 256 meg, the 6200 LE, the later AGP 6200A, and the 6200 PCI. So yes, quite a few, and they're all significantly different from one another. When the 6200 first launched, it was far simpler, however, with just a single model on PCI Express. This launched alongside the 6600 in October of 2004, and they were both essentially the same card. Same PCB, even the same GPU, but the GPU in the 6200 was cut down from eight pixel pipes to four, and even some performance saving features like Z data and color compression were disabled to further differentiate them. NVIDIA referred to this as the NV43V. I assume the V stands for value, but uh, I have no proof. Several months later, NVIDIA released the AGP version, which again, is pretty much identical to the G4 6600 on AGP, both using an HSI bridge. But whether it was on AGP or PCI Express, these early 6200s were produced with a 128-bit memory interface usually, which helped greatly with mitigating the loss of the memory bandwidth saving features I mentioned earlier. Then in December of 2004, there was TurboCache, one of the most infamous technologies of the era. What is it? Well, Basically, it was a way of making the 6200 even cheaper by equipping as little memory as possible on the card and zapping your system memory for the rest. Yeah, all the drawbacks of onboard graphics and none of the benefits. There's a reason it doesn't have the most stellar reputation. I mean, it's a little more cool than most people give it credit for, at least I think. These used a new chip, the NV44, which was specifically designed to connect the PCI Express interface directly to its memory controller, using what NVIDIA called the MMU, or Memory Management Unit, essentially extending the memory bus to include PCI Express as part of it. 16x PCI Express at this time was 4 gigabytes per second in each direction, so this was no small contribution. The drivers did the hard work of prioritizing data, keeping the most indispensable pieces of data on local memory, such as the front buffer, while letting other things like textures stream in when needed. Kind of like AGP texturing, I suppose, but faster and smarter. It also needed to do a lot of work to hide latency, since a trip across the PCI Express interface and through your system's memory controller to main memory would incur a huge latency penalty. Fortunately, well, 
the chip just isn't that fast to begin with. It still had four pixel pipes, but NVIDIA actually lowered the number of ROPs, which were decoupled from the rendering pipes on MP44 to just two. You can see here on this graph what that meant for pixel fill rates compared to MP43, and it's about what you'd expect. The reason I have so many here is that there were a bunch of them made with different memory configurations, namely with the amount of VRAM. The lowest amount was 16 megabytes, which also had the least amount of memory bandwidth, with just a single 32-bit DDR BGA memory chip, clocked at 700 mega transfers per second. The rest of the lineup had a 64-bit memory interface, which was the max supported, with the 32 megabyte version having the highest clocked memory. And would you believe this is probably one of the rarest cards in my collection? It seriously took me like two years to find one. I'm not even kidding. The 64 and 256 megabyte cards have slower clock memory, but try to make up for it by storing more data on board. The 256 meg card is sort of hilarious to even brand as a TurboCache card since it already has more memory than it will ever use. The way TurboCache works, since memory allocation is dynamic, if everything fits on local VRAM, it won't use any system RAM, which could potentially be a disadvantage since PCI Express can actually effectively add more memory bandwidth when properly utilized. In all cases, the marketing for TurboCache cards had to do a lot of exhaustive acrobatics. NVIDIA, at the last minute, mind you, urged card makers to include both supported memory alongside the local memory in their descriptions. So, for example, the 16 and 32 megabyte cards were marketed as supporting 128 megabytes of memory, which technically wasn't a lie as when looking in the display properties, the system actually sees them as 128 meg cards. The 64 megabyte card supported 256 MB and the one with 256 MB on board uh, supported 512 megs, you know, just in case. Now, whether board partners, system integrators, or online retailers consistently honored that level of transparency was another story. The last three cards I have are these, the second iteration of the 6200 AGP, sometimes called the 6200A, the PCI version, and the 6200LE. The 6200LE uses NV44, but has TurboCache disabled on this one, and also has two of its pipes disabled, so it's only got two left. The 6200A and PCI versions use a newer chip, the NV44A, which was reworked to support AGP without a bridge chip, meaning this is actually NVIDIA's last native AGP graphics card. And that can very simply be adapted to PCI as many earlier budget AGP cards were. NV44A maxes out at a 64-bit memory interface, so that's what these use. So that it? We good now? I think we're good now. Let's head over to the benchmarks before I think of something else to say. And like always, I'll be using the overpowered CPU, even though it probably doesn't matter here. And all test system details are in the description as always. And, ah crap, one more thing. Uh, I threw in an FX 5200 with a 128 bit memory interface uh, just to show the progress that was made and all that. Anyway, that's it, let's begin. <laughs> Starting with 3 Mark 2001, the 128-bit cards unsurprisingly lead the pack, and I don't think I have to tell you that this will pretty much be the trend going forward. More interesting is the TurboCache cards, and we see the 16 megabyte version falling way behind the others. The 32 meg version is the fastest thanks to its faster memory and full 64-bit bus, getting 49% more points than the 32-bit 16 megabyte card. The PCI version is also faster than the 16 meg version, as is the GeForce FX 5200, and even the 6200 LE with its measly two pixel pipes scores close to what the 16 megabyte version gets. 
With 3D Mark III posing a more strenuous workload, the 16MB TurboCache card scores amongst the lowest, but manages to squeak ahead of the 6200LE this time by 223 points, or about 16%. This time, the 64MB card scores the highest among the TurboCache cards, and about the same as the AGP 6200A. It's clearly able to leverage the extra bandwidth over PCIe, while the 256MB card does not. The 5200 does better than the 6200LE, but not by much. And 3D Mark 5, the Turbo Cash cards all do really poorly. The 16 MB and 32 MB cards simply don't have enough VRAM to reach their potential, and the 64 MB and 256 MB cards score about the same, well above the other two by around 70%. Puzzlingly, the AGP 6200A does far better than all the other TurboCache cards, even nearing the 128-bit cards. I really can't think of an explanation for that. The 6200 PCI scores about the same as the best TurboCache cards, while the 5200 limps along well behind the others. Aquamark 3 puts the 64MB 6200 above the rest just like in 3D Mark 3, with the 256MB card slightly behind, not taking advantage of the extra PCI Express bandwidth. The AGP 6200A scores above all the TurboCache cards once again, and the PCI 6200 continues to do quite well against its brothers. Serious Sam, the second encounter, seems to value memory speed above all else. The 16 megabyte card with its 32-bit memory bus gets an abysmal frame rate, while the 32 megabyte 64-bit card gets above 60 FPS. The 256 meg turbo cache card and the AGP 6200A score about the same, while the PCI 6200 turns in a disappointing result. The FX 5200 does quite well here. Call of Duty is another fixed function OpenGL game like Serious Sam, and again, memory speed seems to be the top priority. The 32MB Turbo Cache card does better than the rest, and the AGP 6200A is tied with the 64MB card and the FX 5200. The 1% lows are pretty terrible for most of the cards on the chart, with the exception of the FX 5200, which looks a little better in that regard relative to its average. Unreal Tournament 2004 using the Ice Tomb Torture Test makes even the 128-bit card sweat, and once again the 32-meg card does better than the other TurboCache cards, but the AGP 6200A does even slightly better for some reason. The 6200 on the old PCI bus does pretty well here aside from its 1% lows, while the 6200LE and FX5200 trail the rest by wide margin. Halo bunches up the cards pretty tightly, since it's a game that emphasizes shader performance over pretty much anything else. The 16MB card falls behind all other 6200 variants, save for the 6200LE, which along with the FX5200 score well below the playable threshold. The third UMB card actually edges close to the 128-bit cards here. Far Cry is a stressful test for these cards, even lowering the resolution all the way down to 800 by 600 The 128-bit cards do manage to edge close to 60 FPS though, while the TurboCache cards meander between 30 and 40 FPS, the top performer of which being the 64MB card. The 6200A gets close to it though, and the PCI 6200 manages to do better than the 16MB card. The FX5200 somehow makes even the 6200LE look almost twice as good here. Half-Life 2 on the water hazard level puts even the fastest 6200 variants at a barely playable frame rate. Bandwidth matters little here, as the TurboCache cards compete near the top, with the fastest 64MB variant edging close to the 128-bit cards. The slowest is unsurprisingly the 6200LE, although the 60MB card isn't impressing anyone either. The 5200 does alright, though it's not running in DirectX 9 mode. Doom 3 puts a huge emphasis on memory speed, and the 128-bit cards are so far ahead of the others, they don't even look like they're in the same series. The 32MB card does marginally better than the others, and the AGP 6200A gets about the same performance. But honestly, unless you're using a 128-bit card, everything else is pretty much garbage in this game. And then because I'm a psychopath, I tested Fear maxed out at 800 by 600 on this ensemble, and the results were predictably horrible. To be fair, the 128-bit cards almost hit 30 FPS, but didn't, and the rest turned into slideshow, with the FX5200 practically standing still. And now we get to the 8-game average, and there's a lot I want to cover here. The 128-bit cards score over 50% higher than the fastest TurboCache cards, humiliating whatever value proposition they might have offered. There is a slight advantage for the PCI Express version of the 128-bit card over its AGP counterpart, but that's purely due to the slightly higher memory clock. 
The 16 megabyte card is the slowest of the TurboCache lot, unsurprisingly, with its combination of incredibly small VRAM capacity and 32-bit memory interface. While the 32 megabyte card seems to strike the best balance of almost usable VRAM size and higher bandwidth. The 64 megabyte card has slower memory but gets close to the 32 megabyte card nonetheless, in some cases scoring slightly better, showing that VRAM size could matter more than speed depending on each individual circumstance. The 256 megabyte TurboCache card has the slowest memory clock, and the fact that it doesn't really ever leverage its TurboCache technology gives it a decided disadvantage in bandwidth, proving that TurboCache can indeed augment bandwidth when it's being utilized. The 6200 PCI did surprisingly well, and for systems that are limited to a PCI card, it's a very strong performer. The 6200 LE is utterly useless for the Sweetie games, and the FX5200 isn't much better. I find these results really interesting, and they show that while the TurboCache cards were a major downgrade over the original 6200s, the technology wasn't completely useless. And considering not much made use of the bandwidth of PCI Express at the time, this was a novel way to take advantage of it. A 16 megabyte card was well under $100 at the time, so if you barely had any money, which as a teenager in 2004 I could certainly relate to, that was an option, I guess. I mean, if you were adamantly opposed to buying a used GeForce 4 TI4200, that is. But a used DirectX 8.1 card wasn't going to get you the latest features, like pure video, which for a budget user on a probably budget CPU, it was a pretty nice boost to video decoding performance. The 6200 line also supported the latest DirectX 9.0C, which means Shader Model 3.0 and all that it entails. Uh, well... Almost. Uh, despite misleading marketing to the contrary, the G4 6200 actually had HDR with floating point rendering disabled. You can even see that when you load up 3 d Mark 06, as tests requiring FP16 HDR are unavailable. I'm not a fan of misleading marketing, but to be fair, you would never be able to run a game with that feature turned on with anything besides a slideshow, so it's kind of a moot point. If you're stubborn enough, though, you can get around this on NV43-based 6200s anyway, since the NV43 supports that feature in hardware. You just have to use Riva Tuner to fool the driver into thinking it's a 6600, which will also boost performance by re-enabling data compression. You may even be able to enable disabled pipes. Mine didn't want to, though. But make no mistake, this was a huge step up for NVIDIA, not just in terms of budget offerings, but also in their overall baseline shader performance. Just look at 3 Mark 05 and Fear here compared to the previous flagship GPU, the GeForce FX 5950 Ultra. In these DirectX 9 heavy tests, the 5950 Ultra is nearly matched, or even loses by a wide margin depending on the version of the 6200, which is absolutely ridiculous, and I can't think of another time when something like this has ever happened from just one generation to the next. It's worth bearing in mind, though, that due to how the technology works, performance of TurboCache cards is far more dependent on your system configuration than it would be for most GPUs. While I didn't have my Core 2 Duo test system working for the making of this video, in some previously recorded tests, I noticed significantly faster performance in some instances. This may simply be due to how the Intel chipset works with the memory controller and PCI Express interface situated on the same north bridge, making for a shorter trip to system RAM than on, say, an Athlon 64 or Phenom 2 with their integrated memory controllers. In modern times, the G4 6200 has its uses, with great performance in older games and even some Windows 98 compatibility, though I did see a mention on Bogans that TurboCache cards might not work in that OS, but I haven't tried it myself. But the AGP and particularly the PCI version are pretty useful and typically inexpensive. There's no longer support for 8-bit palletized textures and fog tables, but realistically I don't feel like that's a deal breaker for most late 90s and early 2000s games. Anyway, that's about all I wanted to say on the G4 6200, and I think that covers just about everything and then some that anyone would ever want to know. This uh, was an accidental rabbit hole I went down, 
And really this video is just about me taking you along for the ride and trying to justify the senseless purchase of all these different 6200 variants. Turbo Cash would of course continue on for a couple more generations with even some GeForce 8400 GSs sold with the branding. And ATI would push out their own hastily tossed together equivalent hyper memory to cash in on the sweet gimped memory grift that Nvidia started. Hopefully there never comes a time when member prices get so expensive we see a revival of VRAM shortchanging under a flashy marketing name. I have a good feeling about 2026. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes.